Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is Bill Miles with the Hilton Head Island Bluffton Chamber of Commerce. And uh, we're delighted to have you joining us again for our weekly COVID-19 Teletown Hall. What a great week this is in uh, being National Nurses Week and the opportunity to celebrate all those great nurses, not only throughout the state of South Carolina, but also across our great country. And uh, I know like you, like me, will be, uh, we'll be certainly thinking and, and thanking all of our, our nurses. We're happy to have Dr. Kelly Boothelay back with us today, uh, president of the South Carolina Nurses Association. She'll speak a little bit about that as, as Jeremy Clark uh, will from the Hilton Head Regional Healthcare. One of the items that we've been hearing about lately is supply chain, and not only uh, as it's related to, to paper products, but also as it's related today to more of meat products. And we'll have Felix Turner, the Corporate Affairs Manager with Kroger, joining us a little bit later to provide updates on that. Before we get to, to our speakers this morning, I wanted to update you just on a few things that your chamber is doing. Uh, uh, our Path Forward update, our Path Forward readiness plan, we have completed five of those reports, and then the, uh, the remaining four reports will be completed and posted before the sun sets tonight. We started out initially thinking that uh, there would be six task forces that would meet to produce these plans, and as we got into it, we quickly saw that we needed to add child care, as well as arts and culture and faith organizations. So, those will, uh, again, all be completed today and be posted on that, on our website, which is uh, uh, thepathforward.org. So those nine task forces have been meeting and, and come back with some very, very strong recommendations. And uh, what we'll also be doing with that, uh, with those task forces, which was, I want to mention, comprised of residents, as well as government officials and the business community. We'll be taking those and, and currently the ones that are completed are being translated to Spanish. And then, uh, then in the next few days, the Spanish translation path forward readiness plan will be posted on, on the website again. Last week, we also completed a, our second video of a three part series. And if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, I'd ask you to do so. And please share that not only with your friends and neighbors, but with uh, also friends around the country as well. As we, as we move forward, um, hearing the task force meetings last week, we quickly heard that there was, there was a, a great need for additional PPEs, personal protective equipment. So after hearing that, our team here at the chamber went to work on that and we've been able to negotiate with the supplier to fill that need. And uh, from what we're able to find and determine that it certainly has competitive pricing, uh, quantities large and small, anywhere from 100 to 1,000. And uh, the delivery time right now, we're told, is averaging 21 days. Some, some products are being delivered more quickly than that. Others might be a few days longer than that. But uh, this, is a, this is something that we hope will help our residents uh, maintain uh, their safety as well as our, our employees and the, the uh, individuals working at businesses. Kelly Brunson there, you'll notice, has placed the link in the chat, session, in the chat section. So uh, please take a look at that. Or if you have further questions about that, please email pathforward at hiltonheadisland.org. Again, that's pathforward at hiltonheadisland.org. And if you currently have a supplier that, uh, that you're using that is, is providing what you need, we would certainly encourage you to continue to work with them. Uh, if you're having challenges, simply check this out. Also want to mention a local company that is producing hand sanitizer. It's Hilton Head Distillery. And uh, norm, in normal times, they're in the distillery business, the spirits business. And uh, what they have done right now is pivoted temporarily and making hand sanitizer, which is a tropical solution. And it's not in the gel form, but it's in liquid form. And that too will po be posted on our COVID-19 website. So I want you to know that uh, your chamber is doing everything that we can do to get our, our community back to work as safely and swiftly as possible. And notice that I said safely because certainly safety comes first. And with that, uh, with our with our approach that we've been taking with our path forward, we've also de developed a seal. 
And the SEAL says, we took the pledge, safety first. And we have two of those, one that says on the top, it's Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, and on the bottom, America's favorite island. And then also, also we have one for Bluffton as well. And uh, uh, it's the same, except it has Bluffton, South Carolina at the top and uh, Heart of the Low Country at the bottom. So we're, we're encouraging the business community to look at the guidelines provided by the uh, task forces and take a pledge. And then when they, re when they take that pledge, we immediately provide each company, each business with a toolkit that will give you a, uh, a digital emblems that you can use on websites and menus and other things. And then we also have door stickers that we will be uh, providing. So if you haven't, uh, if you haven't received uh, any information yet about that and would like it, please email again, pathforward at hiltonheadisland.org. And then the PPP program, that continues to be uh, something that uh, many, many questions have. We've been fortunate to have Fred Green and, and uh, William Furman with us the past several weeks asking questions along the way. And we wanted to take that one step further. We'll be having them back again this morning for questions. Um, and also tomorrow, which will be uh, uh, Thursday, we're doing a chamber webinar. I got a PP loan, now what? So uh, it'll be a deep dive into the PPP program at 1.30 and uh, Hannah Horn on our staff will be hosting that discussion. And you'll see a link in the chat, chat section below. So as far as the chamber goes, that's what I wanted to update you on this morning. Uh, again, we appreciate you being with us. We're gonna go to our first speaker now. And our first speaker is the Director of South Carolina Parks, Recreation and Tourism. And let's welcome back Dwayne Parrish. Dwayne. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good morning. Appreciate you taking the time to have me on the call again today. And I want to give everyone an update on sort of where we are in regard to tourism throughout the state and at present and sort of where we go forward. So from last time I updated you on hotels closed, we've had a dramatic change. As of today, there are 224 hotels closed throughout the state. This is less than half of the number I reported last week. It's down primarily due to uh, a local ordinance in Myrtle Beach being lifted on hotels being able to open. That, that went into place May 1st, which was last Friday. Um, most of those hotels in Myrtle Beach have reopened. Um, there's been limited occupancy uh, at this point, but nonetheless, they've started, uh, uh, started to pick back up from a business standpoint. The beach has opened up at the same time. Um, the governor has lifted the executive order on CDC hotspots uh, regarding uh, people from New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. No longer uh, are they... Uh, not only not allowed to stay, but also there's no self quarantine in place as well. So uh, people can rent uh, hotels and short term rentals can rent for pe to people from anywhere. Statewide occupancy is around 25%. Um, that would be a little higher, but obviously there was a lot of additional supplies I just mentioned created to the to the statewide market. But I do see that ticking up slightly some this week from where it has been. I believe we have bottomed out in regard to um, occupancy and in in regard to tourism spending. But as I mentioned before, this is sort of a crawl, walk, run process. It doesn't come back. Um, unlike a hurricanes that have hit in the past, we're not back up and running in a couple of weeks. Our Dream Now, Discover Later campaign uh, started with paid media this past Friday and will continue throughout the month, trying to keep South Carolina in top of mind for those that are thinking about traveling. There is not a call to action component of that yet. Um, we have that in place and tentatively scheduled for June 1st. And judging on how things go between now and then, we'll put that in place at that time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the beaches around the Grand Strand uh, opened up uh, May 1st, uh, sort of working way through the southern part of the state. Um, Charleston beaches, most of them will, they, they uh, loosened up on their hours, they were restricted. Um, as of today, the Isle of Palms uh, is open completely. Uh, Edisto Beach opens up today use on this coming Monday. Um, Folly and Sullivan's Island still have some things in place, but will um, the hours have been loosened where they're restricted now and will likely in the next week or so be open completely. In Buford County, uh, Hunting Island State Park opened up last Friday and, um, and then Hilton Head as well. Or excuse me, not as well, but Hilton Head is the last one uh, going south on the beach. And I'm sure Bill, I'm sure you'll talk about that. So the U.S. Senate is meeting this week in person to discuss um, one of the big things that we'll talk about is a phase four of the CARES Act, um, another type of stimulus 
Um, one of the issues they talk, they look at or looking at is the 501c6 be included in the triple P program that Bill mentioned earlier. Um, that's been a big issue across the country. I would certainly look for that to be included. Um, obviously, a lot of things in play there, but we'll wait to see what happens in that. But I would expect some sort of phase four stimulus in the coming weeks. Also, Friday, last Friday, our welcome centers reopened their doors. To, traffic has certainly increased, still down significantly from normal levels, but has increased nonetheless. Um, we have a lot of things in place, protocols, brochures are not out for people to pick up, put back. They're, they're behind the counter now and the like. So we're a little bit different, like many things, different protocols, cleaning protocols in place, but our welcome centers are now open. Along those same lines, State Parks reopened last Friday. We've had heavy visitation crowds on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, matter of fact, 20 of the 47 parks reached capacity on Saturday and 17 reached capacity on Sunday. Um, our overnight reservations in parks starts on May, uh, May 12th. Um, that's the day we began taking reservations. There are a few night over, overnight people in the parks now that booked their reservations three, six, nine months ago that were never canceled. But we started taking new reservations beginning May 12th. Within the park, our uh, places where people still gather in groups are still closed. Retail stores, picnic shelters, community buildings, and playgrounds are all still closed. Our park employees are all wearing masks, and SLED has been helping us out at some of the busier parks to as traffic backs up and people waiting to get in. Um, last Thursday, the response group of Accelerate SC, which is the, gov the governor's task force to uh, uh, get the economy back on its feet in South Carolina, uh, met with several important topics from our industry to talk about in getting reopened that's restaurants and golf courses um, i'll start with golf courses golf courses were never forced to close but different protocols in place the south carolina golf council submitted a recommendations for uh, golf courses with new protocols those were um, okayed by the governor and now are posted on the south carolina department of commerce's website under their covid 19 information um, there's a tremendous amount of information that regardless of the business you're in on there, but the Golf Council's recommendations are on there. Also, the rest, South Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association presented a plan for restaurants. Um, most of you are aware that the restaurants were allowed to open their outdoor dining on Monday of this week, May 4th. Um, the indoor dining date is yet to be determined, um, but we'll certainly have new protocols in place whenever that may be. I would look for that in the coming weeks. Um, the full group of Accelerate SC met um, yesterday. Um, we talked about several things there and got an update from each group. Next up for our industry is what I would call the hotel plan. The South Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association is in the midst of a plan to address hotel swimming pools, spas, fitness centers, and, and uh, meeting facilities. Again, hotels were not forced to close by the state, but swimming pools were, as well as uh, fitness centers. So, you know, there's a plan, there's a plan for that coming, should have that in place, uh, and hopefully by the end of this week. Uh, lastly, the other thing in our group, we talked about our attractions. Um, there's not a state group that represents attractions, but we appointed uh, five people from around the, or five individuals from representing attractions from around the state. That group has met. We have a plan in place, and that will also go before our um, response group on Thursday, along with the hotel plan, and hope to have that in place by the end of the week. And Bill, pending any questions, that concludes my report. Thank you, Dwayne. We do have a question from Casey. And uh, Casey is asking about uh, uh, any idea about lifting restrictions relative to meetings and events for the summer. I know you'd mentioned that uh, the plan will be coming later this week. Don't know if you have anything else to add to Casey's question. No, um, you know, meetings, obviously a small meeting um, are more likely to happen first in regard to large groups. It depends on the size, the meeting, the meeting facility. All will sort of play into that as we go forward. But um Probably not this month, I would imagine, uh, in regard to meetings. And most meetings and groups have canceled that were, that were scheduled to take place in May. Um, June's still sort of up in the air, but it could easily um, roll into June, depending upon how things go. But um, that's something the that hotel plan addresses. And like I said, should be out later this week. But a lot of that will depend on the data and science that come from do, come through DHEC each day. All right, Dwayne, one more question for you. And it's with restaurants opening outside dining, who is responsible for policing the social distancing guidelines? Well, it's sort of three groups in there. One is the individuals themselves. I mean, there has to be individual responsibility of people of attend of excuse me of patrons coming into restaurants to maintain that social distancing. Secondly, is restaurant management, uh, people in the dining room floor, from staff up to management and even ownership to sort of keep that uh, keep that in place. 
And then, of course, DHEC does their normal restaurant inspections throughout the state, and that will be part of what they inspect when they come into a restaurant. So sort of those three levels, self-policing, management policing from the restaurant, and then from the state level, when DHEC does inspect a restaurant, that will be watched as well. Dwayne, that's very helpful. And, uh, you know, the, the individual policing, the self-policing piece of it is so important that we all uh, take the, that upon ourselves to, to act accordingly. So, Dwayne, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to hearing more from you next week. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate the time. Thanks. Our next, uh, next speaker this morning, we're going to sw uh, switch gears a little bit to uh, Dr. Kelly Boothelay. And uh, Dr. Boothelay is the president of the South Carolina Nurses Association. Certainly a big week uh, for, for Dr. Boothelay as well as all of our new nurses. Welcome back to the call, Dr. Boothelay. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, it's kind of ironic. Um, yes, it is Nurses uh, Week. And, you know, I, first of all, excited to be here and really excited to be able to speak on behalf of all the nurses, not just in South Carolina, um, but across the nation and the world. Ironically, um, last year, the American Nurses Association and the World Health Organization named uh, 2020 the year of the nurse and the midwife. Boy, did we not know what was coming um, on a, that the year of the nurse would be the year of the global pandemic. Um, this year is the 200th birthday of Florence Nightingale. And every year we have Nurses Week, um, the, year, the week of her birthday. So this year, we're not just celebrating the week, we're celebrating the month and the year for nurses um, to accumulate her 200th birthday. So it's interesting and kind of ironic that this year we would actually have a global pandemic and nurses would be on the front lines showcasing all of the things that they do every day for patients. And I have to, uh, I would be remiss not to um, mention that nurses do all kinds of different things. We do see on TV all of the nurses in the hospital, you know, providing life saving uh, care and in the ICUs and the EDs, but it's really important to know that there are registered nurses and there's advanced practice nurses like myself that do a lot of different things that are still working to save lives in this pandemic. Um, there's people that are mid midwives, there's nurse practitioners, there's nurses in schools, there's nurses in public health, and goodness gracious, we need them desperately. There's nurses, that are out in the communities right now that are providing home health care to patients that have COVID. Um, my next meeting is actually a care coordination meeting, and we are working at trying to keep patients that are sick at home out of the hospital. And um, there's so many nurses doing so many amazing and innovative things, trying to keep all of the patients that are with, um, that have COVID and all of those that aren't, um, sick and infected with the virus healthy. So I am just so proud of my profession and um, especially those all 44,000 of us in South Carolina. So thank you so much for giving me this platform to um, really just give everyone a shout out and uh, a voice and um, a day to celebrate. So um, I'm sure Jeremy will echo my thoughts um, about um, the good and amazing work that we do. So I couldn't be more proud of what I've given um, most of my life uh, to do um, this amazing service profession. Thank you, Dr. Boothley. A couple questions for you this morning. Sure. Uh, one question comes from Amy. And uh, Amy's question is, when taking temperatures as a screening tool, is 100.4 the accurate number to be used to indicate a fever, or is it 99.0? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, there's some mixed literature on this. I know that CDC uses 100.4, but, you know, everything is in context. So 100.4 is actually, an, up to 100.4 is actually a normal rectal temperature. Um, and I know that most of us are not taking a rectal temperature. Um, it also depends on the thermometer being used. Um, I'm going to just say that the caveat is if you're using an oral, nor, a normal oral thermometer, you could go um, up to be, I would not use 100.4. 
what we're using here at Hilton Head Fire and Rescue for screening our employees, if you have a 99.0 temperature um, without taking any fever reducing medications, that's your Tylenol or your ibuprofen, um, then you have to be screened again and there's a good chance you have to wear a mask to be able to work. If you take a, your temperature and it's 99.5 and you've been taking Tylenol, or any kind of ibuprofen or Aleve, um, then you will probably get sent home. So that's an oral temperature. We, and we based our screening on a New England Journal of Medicine article and culminating the evidence around the country. We work with uh, the University of Washington and the Seattle groups um, and the hospitals and the EMS agencies there. We've worked with other um, high performing systems and uh, information out of the University of Col uh, Columbia in New York. 100.4 is a little high. Patients can be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and not have a fever. Using a temperature gauge that's too high could set you up for having patients with, or people with COVID in your um, employ, uh, employment or your um, workplace. Um, so if you're using a thermal imaging type uh, thermometer or a tympanic, 100.4 may be too high. We chose to go with some of the evidence that was emerging and use a lower temperature. And again, the caveat is if somebody's taking ibuprofen for a sore shoulder or something like that, it's artificially low. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes, that was very helpful. Thank you. Another question. Are there any solid recommendations for attempting social distancing for two to five-year-old children who do not understand yes, the concept? Yep, there actually is. And I, um, in anticipation of this question, I actually went to CDC guidelines and there is a whole, uh, a nice blurb on the, um, the internet about this. Um, regarding um, the guidelines for social distancing children. It's going to be a little tougher, but you know that really the onus comes back down to the parents and to the, and to the uh, daycare providers or whoever else, um, you know, people that are maybe watching children. The, the same principles really exist for children as they do for adults. We have to be mindful about how many children we get together. Um, we really have to take a step back and try not to have too many children congregating together. Um, if it is impossible and there is a group, we have to have a small group. They can still take naps, but have them six feet apart. We need to have frequent hand washing and hand washing stations or sanitizing stations. They should also be screened. They should be screened before they go or screened at wherever they're going to play. Um, and that is simple, taking temperatures, making sure that they're not taking any fever reducing medications um, to artificially lower their temperature. Um, and the CDC guidelines, I pulled them up. Um, it was just guidelines, uh, guidance for care, child care programs, but they have a whole section on social distancing for children. Um, you know, just keeping them apart, but playing together, you know, washing toys, washing um, the spaces, you know, especially bathrooms, um, food preparation, just being using the same principles we use for us, but maybe a little bit more diligent for children, um, because children do pass around illness. That's why schools, you know, will get um, different viruses and, and diseases so quickly when children are in school session. Um, one thing that I would mention about this is that there are some emerging uh, symptoms that I don't know if anybody's seen on the media, but there's a new um, uh, thing, um, a new illness that's related to the coronavirus that can make children really sick because children's symptoms are not similar um, to the adults. And a lot of times children present with fever, sore throat, um, and maybe a runny nose, maybe not, but they're not going to present with that shortness of breath and that cough that the older adults do. So it's really important that we pay attention to how, to the complaints that a child may show. Um, and now there's this anti, uh, this inflammatory um, illness with this rash. So I think we do need to step back and take some um, attention to a child um, that's gonna go play with other children. Maybe we need 
to just really, you know, make sure we do it correctly um, and not have 20 children in a room playing together. Just, just a, just a thought, you know, still wear masks, still um, just take every precaution. Dr. Boothalea has been extremely helpful. I know that uh, you have another, another call you need to jump on, but thank you for uh, being with us again today. And thank you to uh, all the, the great nurses, not only South Carolina, but around the country. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Our next, uh, our next speaker this morning, uh, we've been fortunate several weeks having speakers from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And uh, this morning, we're fortunate to have more Har Hallmark with us. More. Welcome to, the, welcome to the call. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate the opportunity to join you today. And I'll try to be quick. I know you've got a number of other uh, speakers on the call today. Uh, just a quick, quick updates. Uh, as, as Dwayne, I think, mentioned earlier, uh, we, you know, there's additional funds to the Paycheck Protection Loan Program and the SBA's IDLE Loan Programs a few weeks ago. We were grateful. We worked with Congress for that. We were grateful for their appropriating the money. But uh, as we uh, assume and, and are confirmed, uh, that money in the PPP and loan program will likely run out soon. Uh, and then we just learned last night the SBA just reopened its uh, uh, IDLE loan uh, portal yesterday uh, for new applications, but those applications are only for farms and small businesses in the agricultural sector. Uh, they're still processing the applications that were already in the portal when the funds ran out initially uh, on a first come first serve, serve basis. Um, but now trying to address the, the ag industry. But the bottom line, those funds are going to shortly run out or going to run out of uh, funds so, shortly as well. Uh, earlier this week, uh, I know Dwayne mentioned this, um, uh, you know, the potential of C6s being included in the phase four bill. Uh, we sent a letter to Congress earlier this week with um, more than 3,500 state and local chambers, trade associations, and other 501c6 organizations encouraging Congress to include those in the PPP loan programs. Congress does not it really get back into session for the next week or two, and we don't expect a bill, a phase four bill until probably after Memorial Day. And then yesterday, the chamber and MetLife released its monthly small business coronavirus, uh, coronavirus impact poll, surveying small businesses across the country. And among some of the findings of that poll found that 27% 27, 27 of small businesses have shortened their hours. 26 have asked customers for support or started a, uh, a crowdfunding campaign. 19% um, 19, 19 of adjusted employee salaries or wages. Uh, so there's a number of, uh, of, of beneficial information in that survey uh, for small businesses as well. Probably the biggest topic, and, and you alluded to this in your opening remarks, is reopening. It's on everybody's mind, as many states have already begun to do so. Uh, but as we talk about reopening America's economy, there's no precedent. Uh, like you and, and the uh, Hilton Head Chamber bill, the chamber's been talking about a path forward program for a while. We don't have all the answers. In fact, we don't even have all the questions. Uh, but what has become increasingly more certain is any return to work is going to be gradual, phased in, and will be uh, uh, based on various factors such as location, business type, size, and, and the health status of workers. It'll also require social continued social distancing and expanded use of PPEs and other countermeasures. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, there is really no playbook for reopening America's uh, or reopening millions of American uh, businesses while at the same time uh, fighting a, a pandemic. Uh, but there are two things that have emerged as, as major issues that we in the business community and us at the chamber are going to be fighting very heavily. And that is one regulatory uh, matters and then liability. Uh, and this is going to shape our legislative agenda going forward. We've already reached out to the president, congressional leaders, governors, mayors, and other local uh, officials urging federal, state, and local governments to first refrain from converting public health and safety guidance into regulations that may add uh, more challenges uh, and burns to businesses as they reopen. And then secondly, to the maximum extent possible, guidance should be uh, generally consistent across all levels of government. It's just impossible uh, for a one-size-fits-all regulatory approach when you're talking about adopting safety measures for every workplace in America. And additionally, it ignores simply the, what's already we've learned from uh, thousands of essential businesses that have remained open this entire time. Uh, there's also the concern for emerging uh, patchwork of differing, and in some cases, very contradictory guidance differences between federal, state, and local direction. 
for example, in some states or in a state, uh, a, a restaurant may reopen with tables six feet apart uh, and, and, and capacity, limits, uh, capacity limitations based upon square footage, while in another state, tables must be 10 feet apart and, 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 be, and limit occupancy to 25%. We recognize that guidance uh, should be met, uh, that should be meet local conditions, uh, but reducing unnecessary conflicting uh, guidances will make it easier uh, uh, for businesses to do so. And we'll also instill some confidence in the public uh, by consistent, uh, with consistent expectations. And then the other major issue, and I'll kind of wrap up here in just a second, is uh, the, the emergence of, of, of these legal uh, and, and liability concerns employers are going to be facing and quickly are already, and this is already becoming a major uh, battle uh, uh, with congressional leaders on both sides of the aisle. In fact, last week, Senator McConnell drew a red line in the sand when he said, no, the next coronavirus bill uh, must include limited, uh, uh, limited liability protections for employers or won't pass the Senate. There are already more than 350 lawsuits already being filed as a result of COVID-19, and we haven't even fully reopened our, our economy yet. Uh, among the many liability concerns for employers that they're going to be facing potentially as they reopen is health privacy to discrimination, but probably perhaps the largest concern for all businesses is exposure liability. Uh, it includes uh, claims that could be brought against a business that have uh, been designated as essential or as well as remaining businesses once the economy is reopened. Now, the core component of these, com these claims uh, is that a customer or an employee or patient or a member of the general public uh, was exposed to the virus while in a business or a result of a business's particular actions or, or perhaps even failure to act, and then that person gets sick in the end. The theory underlying the legal theories underlining these claims may range from simple uh, negligence to strict liability uh, to public nuisance. Uh, there are other liability concerns um, that we're that that we're concerned about as well for businesses, and that's product liability, for example, uh, where makers of certain products, devices, or equipment, either to treat or to protect uh, from the virus, may not be sufficient protection. Uh, Bill, you mentioned a, a distillery there locally who's now turned their business into making hand sanitizer. This is kind of an issue that would be concerning that they're going to be protected if their hand sanitizer isn't the, at, at a percentage rate that's that's the best. Um, then you've got medical liability. There's already an increasing concern for claims against uh, healthcare providers and facilities that have treated COVID-19 patients. And then there's also securities uh, litigation. Uh, there are already class actions that have been filed against businesses such as the cruise industry or the pharmaceutical sector uh, based on stock, uh, stock price drops uh, resulting from the, uh, from the impact of the pandemic as well. These are legal liability issues that, that have become priorities for all of us in the business community but are shaping our legislative agenda as we go forward this year at the federal level. A lot of states are already starting to look at these uh, liability issues as well. And for example, last week in North Carolina, the General Assembly passed legislation over the weekend uh, that included limited liability protections for essential businesses and hospitals. So with Bill, I'll stop there. And if there's a question too, I'm happy to answer it. I do have to jump off for a 10 o'clock call in a minute or two as well. But, but again, I thank you for the opportunity and thanks for all that you're doing and your partnership with the U.S. Chamber. Thank you, Moore. We appreciate you being with us today and uh, we'll let you head on to your next call and look forward yeah. to having you back on again. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bill. Take care. Bye-bye. We're going to shift now to uh, Fred Green. Fred is the president and CEO of the South Carolina Bankers Association. Fred, welcome back on the call this week. Thank you, Bill, and good morning to you and your members. Thanks for having me on the call again. Uh, last week, uh, I, I gave a quick report on the first 48 hours of the second round of PPP being opened and it was uh, it was very choppy, uh, a lot of system failures. I think everybody was frustrated. You could probably uh, probably heard frustration in my voice as well. But things took a turn for the better uh, later Wednesday. Uh, really took off Thursday and Friday. And as of Friday afternoon, um, every bank that I touch base with had been able to process their entire inventory of uh, the backlog of applications 
that they had on file. Um, the SBA, and, and William might go into a little more detail about this, but the SBA did release some statistics for, as of Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. And as of that point in time, uh, basically five days, there had been 2.2 million loans uh, processed and approved for 175 billion. And the other interesting thing is the average uh, loan amount was 79,000, and that's uh, less than half of the average loan amount the first go round. Uh, in that report issued Friday, they did get a little more granular and reported by state. So in South Carolina, and again, pretty much since Monday and Tuesday, very little happened, but uh, Wednesday through Friday, there were 28,400 loans approved for 1.9 billion. And again, that average is, is fallen uh, to less than half of the first round. South Carolina average is 67,000. So uh, to put it in perspective, the, the first round, uh, South Carolina did 3.8 billion. Again, second round as of the first few days, 1.9 billion. Um, and so kind of fast forward from there, uh, late yesterday evening, there was an update, not as granular, so I can't report any South Carolina numbers, but uh, as of 5 p.m. yesterday, <clears throat> the uh, number of loans approved on a national basis, 2.4 billion for 181 billion. Again, the average continues to fall at 75,000. So if I extrapolate going forward based on the, the application flow between Friday at 5 p.m., Tuesday at 5 p.m., that implies that we're on a pace uh, that the PPP availability will still be in place through next week. Again, this is anecdotal, but uh, I've talked to several bankers who had a big backlog. They were able to process those. They're still accepting applications, but applications are coming in in ones and twos versus in mass before. So I, I think that uh, there's still availability. Those small businesses that have not applied and, and feel like they uh, would qualify, need to go ahead and do it now. And I think their application would get uh, <clears throat> processed and then being able to get an answer probably within, you know, half a day or so. Just, I've got, Bill, I've got three other quick things. Uh, so now that uh, the PPP loans have been made, continue to be made, uh, maybe in reference to your webinar tomorrow afternoon, uh, the question continues to come up, how about the forgiveness? Uh, when does that kick in? As everybody knows, it's basically two months of payroll expense. And the only update I can give there is SBA and Treasury still have not issued any guidance or rules. So there's very little that anyone can do until those guidance and rules are issued and then that would give everyone the opportunity to determine what portion of that PPP loan uh, might be forgiven. The second thing is uh, early on, there were a few high profile public companies that uh, made the news that had been, uh, I guess they had, they had had some pretty high dollar uh, PPP loans approved, and they qualified according to the rules, but not the intent. A lot of those uh, have since returned the loan proceeds, and in fact, SBA and Treasury um, indicated last week that they would review and audit every PPP loan over $2 million to determine whether the, the borrower had uh, alternative sources of capital, which says, said another way that you really needed the loan. Uh, they also uh, have given a safe harbor that if, if you really did not need the loan, you had other sources of capital, 
if you uh, paid that loan off by uh, May 14th, uh, everything would be forgiven. And then the last thing, since y'all uh, on all the previous callers, I mean, the previous panelists, you talked about uh, opening business. Well, the banking industry is looking at the same things as well. We're an essential business and our banks never did close. We did close um, lobby availability um, on a walk-in basis, but the drive-in facilities remained open. The uh, lobbies uh, were open by appointment only. And of course, we all had to take advantage of, of uh, technology to a much greater extent. That being said, uh, we are looking at, uh, as, as an industry, on when we will open those lobbies back up for uh, walk-in traffic and uh, what additional um, uh, things we need to do. And it probably falls in line with a lot of your retailers dealing with the number of folks per uh, square footage of the facility and things like that. But uh, again, PPP has really done a great job. SBA has done a great job to get it up and running and correct what had, had happened, I guess, the first couple of days and made up for it really in the next couple of days. And again, to your members on the line, if you think you qualify for PPP and have not applied, I would encourage you to do it. So, Bill, I'll, I'll stay on the line for questions, but thank you again for including me. Thank you, Fred. We'll, we have uh, a question for you, and then we'll have a few more questions after after William speaks. But I think this one, uh, first of all, uh, can be addressed by you. It comes to us from Maggie, and Maggie is asking what your thoughts are about individuals being allowed to wear masks into banks. Maggie, that's a big question that we're talking about uh, among our bankers, and the general consensus is if someone uh, feels comfortable that, that they need to wear a mask, they will be able to enter the lobby. What we're talking about is, you know, there is a concern um, of security, uh, you know, bank robberies, things like that. So there'll probably be some, you know, maybe someone at the entrance of the office and just ask the person with the mask as an example to, take it off momentarily so there will be, uh, you know, some uh, video uh, uh, record of everybody coming in the office. Uh, you'll also, as an example, if you're, if you're there to cash a check or whatever and you need to present your identification, you might have to take it off at the uh, teller line. I think all of the branch offices will have the you know, the uh, protected devices, the sneeze guards and things like that. Uh, but again, uh, Maggie, that's one of the big things we're talking about, trying to work around ways to, again, accommodate the customers and protect the facility. Fred, thank you. And we appreciate you staying on. We'll uh, rotate to uh, William Furman, who's a senior area manager for the SBA. And then we'll have some questions for both of you after that. William? Good morning. Thank, thank you again for having me as well. Um, I, I, I'm just going to summarize a few things. Fred really um, kind of covered it. And, you know, I think this is, is really good news. So, you know, what we're saying is that with the PPP program, um, the, ultimately the businesses have obtained the funding that they need. So, you know, we're not seeing, I've talked to a lot of lenders as well, um, they're not, they have caught up. Some of them, you know, are processing a, a, a few loans. Um, some of them are, are totally caught up. Uh, and the loans that they're seeing are, are very small, and it's primarily those sole proprietors and independent contractors at this point that are coming in. Um, you know, if you recall, they, they got, um, they were delayed for a week in the beginning. And so that, that may be part of it, but, um, you know, I think you may be seeing a few businesses that are making that decision that, you know, maybe they, they thought they didn't need it at the beginning, but maybe they're changing their minds at this point. Um, but that, I, it, that is really, really good news to me um, to, to see that the, the banks have been able, SBA and the banks, and I, again, I, I thank the banks for everything that they've done because I know they've been working very hard um, to get this done. 
Um, so we're really pleased with that. Right now we have about um, somewhere in the range, these numbers change quickly, but we have somewhere in the range of $130 billion left in funding. Um, and so again, with the loans becoming smaller, the demand becoming less, uh, these funds are lasting longer than, than really anyone anticipated. So uh, just good news on that front. Uh, again, this is a, a point of frustration um, in that SBA still has not issued the final rule on debt forgiveness. Um, I'm getting a lot of inquiries about that, and, and we can't give answers until we get um, until we get that final rule. Uh, one thing they did come out with, though, that I do want to mention is that um, uh, they did clarify that loan forgiveness will not be reduced if a business tries to rehire a laid-off employee, but the employee declines to come back. Uh, so we did get that little piece. Um, the business just needs to make sure that it, you know, that offer is in writing and that you have good documentation um, to support all of that. Um, moving on to the economic injury disaster loan front, uh, we did open the application portal, and, and this is a little bit of duplication here, I know, but I just want to make sure everyone is clear on this. Um, it is, however, uh, only for agricultural enterprises that have now been determined eligible to apply. And so when, when the IDO first came out, agricultural enterprises were not an eligible uh, business to apply for the economic injury disaster loan. So they've changed that rule, and now they have opened the, the portal for those agricultural enterprises. Now, in addition to the agricultural enterprises, the portal is also open for those businesses that applied early on, and I'm talking like in March, um, that did not have the opportunity to apply for the forgivable immediate advance. And so for those businesses, they have to go back in and reapply to receive that immediate advance. So agricultural enterprises and those early on businesses that, that need the immediate advance, they can go in and apply. Um, and we do hope that the portal will be uh, open to all businesses in the very near future. Um, so we, we're, we haven't given up on that. Uh, hopefully, uh, again, that will be open in the, in the coming days. Um, for those that, that have applied, you know, we're still, you know, the, 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 with the portal being closed, it has given the processing center the opportunity and the chance to, to try to, to get caught up um, or at least get their arms around the number of applications that they have. So we're seeing those applications that were filed in, in late March and early April. Um, those businesses are starting to, to see their funding. Um, so if you're in that category, um, just just be aware of that. You should be you should start to see some activity very soon. Uh, the first thing you're going to see is a deposit uh, in your bank account for the immediate advance. So that's going to be the first thing. You may see a hit on your credit uh, report as well. Um, and and when you see that, just know that they are definitely working on your application. Um, unfortunately, and I think I've mentioned this before, we cannot go in the sys in our system to to look to see what the Office of Disaster Assistance is doing, um, but you can call the customer service number and they have limited information. I'm not going to say they will be able to give you full detail, but they will have limited information on your, your application. Uh, and that number is 1-800-659-2955. Uh, so that's 1-800-659-2955. And if all else fails, I will give you my cell number. Um, that number is 843-324-0788, and I'll be happy to try to assist you the best I can uh, with any issue you may have. Uh, and again, that's 843-324-0788. And with that, that's, uh, you know, we're, we're pushing through everything. Um, things are, are going well today and uh, here in SBA, and, and I'll be happy to take any questions if, if anybody has any. Thank you, William, for that update. The uh, first question comes to us from Joe. And Joe is uh, asking, he said, I uh, heard yesterday that if you tried to apply for an idle loan previously and got, got a confirmation number beginning with two, you should go to their sba.gov website and reapply. Uh, can you answer 
if that's yes. Yeah, so so what what that means is that if your application has a two, that means that you were not given the opportunity to apply for the immediate advance, which can be up to ten thousand dollars and does not have to be repaid. Now that immediate advance is based on your number of employees, and the the, the equation for that is simply a thousand dollars per employee up to ten. Um, and so, yes, if, if your application number started with two, please go in today. It's, it's a very straightforward, simple process. You do not have to upload any documentation. Um, you simply complete about four screens. And, and one of those screens is for the immediate advance up to $10,000. Thank you, William. Our next question is for uh, Fred, and it comes to us from Jim. Jim is asking, was the $181 billion for PP loans you mentioned for both fundings or just the second? Uh, Jim, that was just for the second. So that's $181 billion out of the $310. So again, uh, William pointed out there's still $130 billion remaining. And of course, that $181 was as of 5 o'clock yesterday. Thank you, Fred. Uh, the next one comes to us from Keith. And Keith is asking, we have applied for the idle loan and received the, imme the immediate advance grant, but have not heard about anything more than that. What do we need to do besides wait? Yeah, well, that, that's kind of a good news and bad news. Um, the good news is that you've received the grant, so you know that they have your application and you know it's, it is in process. Um, the bad news is at this point, you just need to be patient and wait. Uh, you know, there's not a lot you can do on your end until they are able to, to get to your application and, and get that processed. Um, so the, the application portal is still closed except for those uh, certain groups. Um, and that is giving the processing center uh, additional time to, to, to try to catch up. So just be aware of that. And hopefully they will get to your application very soon. Thank you, William. Last question for you gentlemen is uh, if an employee does decline the offer to come back, does it also lower the 75% requirement for pay, payroll costs? And that comes to us from Patricia. So that was not addressed specifically, um, but my thought would be that it would not change that 75% um, uh, requirement. And, and so, you know, you have to wonder, you know, what's going on and why SBA is taking their time to issue these final rules. And, and I think the answer to that is, is that, you know, Congress recognizes and SBA recognizes that um, there, there are issues. It, you know, some businesses have started their eight week um, period uh, that they have to, to spend their funds um, and those businesses are closed. And so it's very difficult for a closed business to spend their their PPP funds on payroll. And, and so I think they're trying to come up with some answers on that. And, and uh, you know, this is a, patience is a hard word uh, right now, but I think we just need to try to be patient and, and hopefully we'll like the outcome when they final, finally issue that, that final rule. William, thank you. And Fred, thank you. I'll remind our listeners this morning that uh, again, tomorrow, the deep dive on the PPP program which will be at 1.30, uh, beginning at 1.30 tomorrow on Thursday. And there's a link in the chat section to register, register for that. So William and Fred, thank you. And uh, we'll talk with you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Moving on to our uh, local perspective now, we have Mayor Lisa Salka, the mayor of town of Bluffton, as well as Mark Orlando, our town manager in Bluffton. Welcome, Mayor Salka. Oh, good morning. Good morning. I'm so sorry. I'm multitasking. Um, well, just a couple of things, and I'm really going to let Mark chime in on more town stuff. Nothing much has changed except, you know, the town and the police department continue to enforce the governor's current orders that he has on the table. Um, one thing I would like to ask, I noticed there are 160 plus participants. I don't know how many other people are listening on Facebook, but you know, I'm curious how many of y'all have filled out your census. Uh, it is so easy. We're all still hunkering down. It takes a minute and a half to do online. I cannot urge everyone and especially the chamber to help us get that message out because it does provide money from the federal government for all the things we're concerned about today. Hospitals, schools, 
towns, projects. Um, it is so important that we get the right count. And we've been working off the 2010 numbers, which all of you know how fast Bluffton has grown and especially, you know, our whole county. So I really wanted to reiterate that anything everyone can do on the census. Um, we passed a resolution on masks and best practices. And I think our best practices and our guide to open up Bluffton is very closely correlated with your, uh, the Chambers program on reopening. Uh, I talked to the GMA Montage last week. They're opening up some of their rooms and plan to open up a little more of their hotel in June. So that was very exciting for Bluffton. That's our large hotel um, in our town and one we're a real partner with. And um, graduation. I just, you know, it's more of a shout out. I feel for these high school kids and anything anyone on this call can do to really help celebrate these seniors. We all know that time moves on and, you know, high school graduation is just a memory, but for them, it's the end all and it is very important to them. And Dr. Rodriguez, if he's on the call or not, I know will update us on his thoughts of graduation plans and Bluffton really supports it and are, we're going to do everything we can to make it special. And that's all I have. And Mark, if he's on the call, can fill you in on any town updates. But thank you again for letting us be on the call, Bill. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mark, Mark Orlando. Hey, good morning, Bill. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I don't have a lot of uh, big updates since last week, just that we continue to move forward as we plan to return to work in, in phases. Uh, working alongside Steve and Ashley and, you know, Hilton Head and Beaufort County and others. Um, I'm proud to report that with the exception of community events, we are 100% operational. So municipal court will be held in May, permitting, licensing. Our permit numbers are still coming in. Of course, they're a little lower than last year, but our building permits and commercial permits are still being submitted in the town of Bluffton. So we haven't seen any real true hard stop negative uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we uh, are literally putting a return to work plan in place though, just like everything else that we're hearing on the call today. We're trying to think of what the new, the new normal is in some months. We understand that some municipalities and county governments are soft opening through the month of May throughout our state and beyond. Um, I believe that we're going to stay in place and work remotely where we can as much as we can through at least the month of May. Our parks still remain closed and I would imagine those starting to reopen uh, in, the new, in the near future. Um, we have kicked off our small business resiliency plan and of course Hilton Head Island, Bluffton Chamber as a, as a good partner. We have a task force kickoff meeting this week uh, with the Don Ryan Center, with USCB involved, Hilton Head, Bluffton Chamber, and a whole bunch of others, Beaufort County Economic Development Corp. So I'm looking forward to getting on that kickoff uh, call with Mayor Salka and, and, and others uh, later. We've put a survey out to all of our businesses um, and some letters trying to hear from them directly on the measures that we are putting in place and the response that we are, put, that, that we are working on to see how it's helping them if at all. So we'd like to hear back from our businesses. Um, we have a, a pretty decent resource guide that the Don Ryan Center uh, continues to work on with folks. Um, as Mayor said, we've in, in past calls, we've, we've uh, extended the business license renewal date till August 7th, which I think could be a, a, a good help for our businesses. Definitely enforcing our governor's orders. Um, and Mayor said something about the high school graduation, which is great. We are working on um, some, some things to celebrate these young, these young people that are graduating. Um, support your nonprofits. I heard that uh, some time ago, um, and I keep saying it no matter what call I'm on. It is amazing to me to see the Community Foundation of the Low Country uh, and a whole bunch of others uh, continue to raise money in our community to help those people that need help not just people, but helping organizations and business. Um, and uh, our budget. So I present our budget to town council a week from today. Um, we, have, uh, we have taken a look at our revenues and we've taken a look at, a careful look at our expenditures. And I'm pleased to present a budget to them next week. So stay tuned more on that. 
I'm pleased to say that we aren't talking about any furloughs or layoffs, um, anything like that, but we have made uh, uh, some real hard cuts internally so that we can respond and continue to take care of the community with the current workforce, um, but as well uh, be very careful with our, with our uh, revenues and cash flow. So uh, more, more to come next week. And thanks again for having me on the call. Thanks, Bill. Mark, thank you. And Mayor, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, we'll transition to Hilton Head Island with uh, Mayor John McCann and Steve Riley. Good morning, Bill, and thank you for continuing to hold this meeting once a week. Tomorrow is National Prayer Day, but I thought a great time to do the preview on that would be today. In this pan pandemic, it is only fitting that we take a moment every day, but especially today, and to reflect on our lives and our blessings. This unprecedented time calls for unprecedented prayers, meditation, and hope. I ask that each of you pray for our community, our businesses, and families who have lost their loved ones. We have faced some difficult moments, but we have shown our strength as a community. I am sorry for those who have lost their jobs, who have been laid off, and are struggling financially and emotionally. It is my hope that we will all rebound. I am grateful for everyone who has lent a helping hand to those in needs. The generosity and unexpected gifts we receive daily keep us uplifted. I am thankful for the spiritual leaders who pray at our community for, at our town council meetings, giving us a sense of peace and understanding. I appreciate those who are praying for our leaders, first responders, teachers, parents, healthcare and workers, and many others. Those prayers are getting us through this pandemic and the challenges we face every day. I pray that we're able to carry out our daily lives with patience, kindness, and respect for each other. We are all in this together and we'll get through this together. Please wash your hands, use your face mask, and practice social distancing. With that, Steve. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll touch on some normal, boring business stuff. So our very first sea turtle nest of this season was, uh, occurred this past weekend, which tells us we're in the sea turtle uh, season and we all need to be uh, cognizant of, of lights out after after dark and, and all the rest that goes along with that. We also have, um, as we now have opened two of our beach act, public beach accesses, we've got new rules that came into effect for this beach season um, about shovels, no shovels longer than 30 inches, no wider than six inches, must be made of wood or plastic, no holes deeper than 12 inches, and all holes have to be filled 30 minutes before sunset. And also this year, um, there's no leaving of your personal equipment on the beach overnight. Um, We've been seeing people leave tents and stuff out there. Uh, they will now be um, taken if you have tried to leave them overnight. So new rules that we hope everybody is aware of. Tomorrow marks the opening of our first, two of our first parks, community parks, uh, Jarvis Creek Park and Crossings Park. Crossings will not allow team play at this point, and um, while the bathrooms will be open, playground equipment is still un unavailable per the governor's orders. Um, next week, town council meets on Tuesday. The first item of business will be budget. This is another major item of business will be this, this further discussion about um, opening of beach accesses and opening of town parks. Um, course in the midst of all of this we are also actually starting to send out the messaging about hurricane season so um, that starts June 1st and not that far away our um, internally at, at staff we have transitioned out of what we call our emergency operations mode and into our recovery mode um, different team of people led by Sean Collin our director of community development and so now we are standing up our, our recovery transition team and moving into that area of focus. Town hall does remain closed and probably will for the foreseeable future. Um, another good news point is that uh, if you've driven through the Shelter Cove area, you know, we've been working hard out there on traffic improvements, uh, new traffic lights and whatnot. The last of the paving was completed last night and they should be wrapping up and out of there with all the cones gone. Um, hopefully by the end of the week and certainly by early next week. And taking on to uh, Mark Orlando, support your favorite charity. And that's all I've got. Thanks, Bill. Mayor McCann and Steve, thank you. Appreciate the update this morning.
Uh, let's hear from Beaufort County Council Chairman Joe Passman. Chairman Passman. Good morning, Bill, and good morning, everyone. Well, I'd like to acknowledge something. There's a approximately 160 of us on the phone call today because we're able to do things from home at this point in time. So um, I'd like to give a tremendous shout out to those people who cannot work from home. They have to go to a job every single day with great personal risk, and we're very grateful for their work and dedication. I'd also like to acknowledge the county's small business owners you know, we know everyone wants to get back to work as soon as possible. They're at the forefront of our minds, and we continue to navigate these un unchartered waters. Um, we have a long-term new normal ahead of us, and as such, we have to remain flexible and adapt to the circumstances while we prioritize the safety of our Beaufort County residents, many of whom are older and thus more vulnerable to the virus as well as prioritizing the safety of nearly 1,100 employees and their families. Now, we're going to take our cues from our governor and state health officials. In the meantime, our county administrator, Ashley Jacobs, is working with our staff to come up with a plan to reopen. And I'm going to go through some of those elements in a minute, but it's also going to be done in conjunction with our municipal leaders around the county. So. The reopening plan is to gradually return our employees to work and allow the public to utilize our facilities. We've received detailed guidance from the Centers for Disease Control, which will be the foundation of our plan. This will include the extensive use of PPE to protect both our employees and the public. We'll keep social distancing, We'll do regular cleaning and disinfecting in place until we have notification from the CDC that it's safe to remove those measures. Uh, as I said, this plan will be in coordination with town and city managers. We're aiming to have our employees return gradually by the end of May and possibly to open to the public in early June. But certainly this depends upon the current rate of effect, infection. Our county attorney, is working with our boards and commissions to set up a policy that will allow them to meet virtually until it's safe to meet again. Um, the county is looking for modifications that we need in place at the various points of contact in our county buildings where employees might interact with the public by putting up plexiglass, plexiglass basers, ba barriers, can't talk this morning, um, sanitizing set, uh, stations, providing masks, cleaning supplies. Um, our departments are considering ways of employees working together while maintaining appropriate distance. And any changes to services and schedules will, of course, be announced to the public. Um, for the time being, County Council will continue to meet and take public comment virtually. And as we reopen, it's important to keep in mind that it's not business as usual because we don't have a vaccine. We must all work together to keep us safe and healthy. And on one related note, our county treasurer, Maria Wall, sent a letter to the State Department of Revenue to see if we can again open the online portal so that people who want to pay taxes in installments can do that. And I'm happy to announce that on May 4th, uh, the Department of Revenue issued a letter saying uh, that would be allowed. So uh, we're doing the best we possibly can, and I'm happy to be on the call, Bill. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Passman. We appreciate you joining us today, and thanks for the Beaufort County update. We'll, uh, we'll shift gears a little bit now to, uh, to DHEC, and we'll hear back from Dr. Michael Kekka. Dr. Kekka? Thank you. Can you hear me? There. We sure do. Uh, okay, perfect. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so we are reporting uh, 1,105 new cases of COVID-19 in the past week, which brings our total of people confirmed to have the disease in South Carolina to 6,841. This includes 10 new cases in Beaufort County. One additional case was reported from the zip code 29928 
and no additional cases from 29926. That brings the total to 28 for both of those zip codes. Unfortunately, today we are also reporting 104 additional COVID-19 related deaths in the past week. This includes 29 deaths identified in previous, uh, previous weeks as part of a review of death certificates submitted to our vital records department. This brings the total number of people in the state who have passed away from the virus to 296. Two additional deaths were reported in Beaufort County individuals. It is important to understand as South Carolina increases testing, there will be more lab confirmed cases. This may reflect more cases being identified rather than a true increase in the number of cases in the state. So I've also been asked this morning to discuss the process of contact tracing because there's been a lot of talk around that, that topic. So contact tracing is the process of identifying people with the disease and those people are referred to as cases and then identifying everyone that that person, that everyone that that person uh, could have infected. And these people are referred to as contacts. It's a process that DHEC staff conduct almost daily with diseases like hepatitis A or tuberculosis. Um, the cases are interviewed by regional DHEC staff to determine when their symptoms started, to determine when they may have been contagious with the disease. They are asked to identify anyone they may have had close contact with while contagious. So for COVID-19, close contact is defined as being within six feet of someone for at least several minutes. Uh, fortunately, COVID-19 does not seem to spread with just casual contact with another person. We, of course, also have to consider people who may have shared the same space and may have um, become infected from the virus being on surfaces like counters or doorknobs. The contact tracer then goes um, to those identified as contacts. So privacy is maintained um, in this process. So they are only told that they were in contact with someone who's known to be a case of COVID-19. Um, they are asked, they're told to complete a quarantine period where they must stay home and avoid contact with others until they are no longer at risk of developing the disease. For COVID-19, this is 14 days after their last contact with the case. Of course, those found to have caught COVID-19 are required to complete their own isolation period until they're no longer contagious. So there are different levels of contact tracing. And in fact, DHEC staff have been completing contact tracing on all reported cases of COVID-19. This has included follow-up with the case to outline their, their requirements to isolate until they are no longer infectious, to identify their close contacts, especially those within their own household, and to provide the quarantine requirements for those, those uh, close contacts. So the plan going forward is for DHEC to increase its capacity, capacity to conduct these investigations um, to ensure there's no delay in reaching the case uh, when they are reported, identifying all their close contacts and speaking to them directly about their quarantine requirements. This may include daily calls to the contacts in quarantine to discuss if they have experienced any symptoms. So we are looking at uh, not only increasing our staff to accomplish this, but also uh, other technological solutions that may help us manage the large amount of information that needs to be collected and managed throughout this process. So successful implementation of contact tracing requires individuals to take responsibility to truthfully report all the information and to follow the recommendations of public health officials. Isolation and quarantine orders are enforceable by law, including through fines levied by DHEC for violations, but we cannot undo damage caused by individuals not following their requirements. Increased contact tracing and testing is part of the National and South Carolina plan to safely reopen, and DHEC is working to ensure we have the capacity to get that done. And for any additional information, uh, please visit our website, scdhec.gov slash COVID-19. And I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Dr. Kaka. Yes, we have a question that comes from Amy. And uh, Amy's question is, is it recommended that employees go to a physician to be tested for COVID-19 antibodies? And if so, how do employers use the results to guide current practices? Uh, we just put out some guidance on this for businesses, actually. Um, the, the problem is that the antibody tests on the market are brand new right now, and we are in the process of determining just 
what their usefulness will be. We can't guarantee that the antibodies that they detect uh, prove that someone has uh, immunity against further COVID-19 infections. And that's why we urge caution. We, we don't want employers to be sending employees out to get these tests and to assume that the results mean that they're either not immune or immune. Uh, we still have a lot to learn about the tests at this time. Thank you, Dr. Kaka. That was very helpful. Let's uh, shift gears now to uh, Jeremy Clark, who's the market chief executive for uh, Hilton Head Regional Healthcare. Jeremy, welcome. Good morning, Bill. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We've got you right, All right. there. Hello. Uh, hello there. I'm really excited to be back. Thank you again for having me. You know, as in previous weeks, Hilton Head Regional Healthcare remains ready, uh, ready to provide safe care in our ERs, ready to provide safe care in our operating rooms and our imaging centers, and, and ready to receive a surge of patients if, if indeed that happens. Uh, but to start off, I want to reiterate something that was said earlier as today is the first day of Nurses Week, and just really want to thank all of the nurses uh, who are part of Hilton Head Regional Healthcare, but, and also all the nurses across the community. Uh, you know, the, the coronavirus situation has uh, shown a spotlight on nurses and, and what they do, but I think what everyone needs to realize is this is what nurses do every day, uh, providing passionate, high-quality care to, to patients who are scared, uh, to patients who have highly contagious diseases. Uh, this is what they do. And so uh, this, this situation has definitely shown a spotlight on them, but uh, they really deserve to be recognized and, and celebrated every day, but, but especially this week. So I appreciate all the nurses who are out there and everything they do for our community. You know, the last uh, week was a very exciting one for Hilton Head Hospital and Coastal Carolina Hospital as we are leading the creation of a safer standard of care, building on the, the safe care that we've always provided, uh, but also building new ways to look at care and building around the principles of uh, testing, of screening, spacing, and cleaning. And a, a big part of that, the first one of those is testing, and we've had some great developments in the past week. First, we went live with the Abbott ID Now coronavirus rapid testing system uh, that we were fortunate uh, to be selected by DHEC to receive at Coastal Carolina Hospital. Uh, we already were using our ability to get results in a quick amount of time, less than an hour, to make clinical decisions on the treatment of patients who are appropriate for this test and really help them out. So we're very excited to have that and, and hopeful that we will be able to continue to roll that out and expand that capacity over the coming weeks and the months. We also went live with our outpatient uh, COVID-19 testing with a physician order at both Hilton Head Hospital and Coastal Carolina Hospital. So we are now offering that uh, five days a week for patients who, who are symptomatic and who have a physician order to receive testing. They can do that at either, at either one of our hospitals. And we're able to do that because we've got an, a more than adequate supply of personal protective equipment, of staff available to do it, and of testing kits as well. So, you know, as we create this, this safer standard, um, it's all about creating a safer environment to, to provide care and for patients to receive care in. And, and one place that usually starts is in the emergency room for patients. So I want uh, folks in our community to know that our ERs are safe. Uh, if, you, if you come to the ER as a patient, you're gonna be given a mask. You're gonna look around you and see all of the staff and all the physicians uh, are wearing masks as well. We have, again, more than an adequate supply of personal protective equipment. Uh, to keep you safe, uh, but also to keep them safe as well. I also want you to know that all potential coronavirus place, patients in the ER are placed in dedicated private rooms. Uh, that's to provide the best care for them, but it's also to provide safe, uh, high quality care for the many more patients who are not there with coronavirus symptoms. So really working hard to create that safe ER um, uh, is one of our focuses right now. Also uh, creating a safe uh, operating room environment. And so a few weeks ago, both hospitals went live with elective surgeries, so performing elective surgeries. Uh, again, we've had great reception on that. Patients who had postponed care and need care, surgeons who are highly skilled and able to provide that, and staff who are, who are excited to be back at work. So that's been really well received. It's great to see patients uh, receiving care again, uh, care that they'd put off. And, and we'll really be able to tell you today is a very busy day as well. So that's great to see that coming back. Uh, it's great to see patients uh, getting the care that they need. So again, these are very exciting times for Hilton Head Regional Healthcare. Uh, we remain ready, uh, ready to provide safe care in the ERs and our ORs and our imaging centers, ready to receive a surge of patients as well. Uh, we appreciate the leadership from our state and local officials. We appreciate everyone's uh, support for our caregivers. And uh, one more time, happy Nurses Week to all of our nurses out there. So Bill, I'll turn it back over to you and see if there are any questions. 
Jeremy, thank you, and thank you for that that uh, update. And we ask that uh, please please uh, give our thanks to all of your nurses and and share our our great respect and appreciation for what they do each and every day. And thank Definitely. you for your update. Thank you. Next, uh, we talked about supply chain a little earlier, and uh, we're we're fortunate to have Felix Turner with us again. Felix is the corporate affairs manager for Kroger, and I uh, certainly want to give a shout out to, to Kroger Corporation. After Felix was on our call a few weeks ago, uh, they they provided a ten dollar ten thousand dollar a ten thousand uh, dollar donation to Second Helping. So, Felix, thanks for that investment in our community, and we look forward to uh, hearing an update from you. Uh, thank you, Bill, and uh, thank you for having me on again. And um, very pleased to be able to partner again with uh, Second Helpings. Uh, they do a, a wonderful job uh, there uh, in the area, uh, supporting uh, people that that are in need uh, from a, a food insecurity standpoint. So uh, we were we were pleased to be able to do that. Um, just want to provide just a few um, couple points as far as just updating uh, how we've been doing from a safety standpoint with our associates, and then I'll get right into into the supply chain from a meat perspective. Uh, so on April 17th, uh, we implemented a mandatory uh, mass requirement in all of our stores in the Atlanta division. Um, we, we are providing surgical and cloth masks to all of our associates. And probably by the middle of next week, uh, we will be 100% from a temp checking standpoint of all of our associates before they begin their shift. Uh, so uh, really, really um, pleased with that. Uh, great feedback from our associates uh, from that perspective. Um, we're also installing some additional plexiglass uh, in our stores to actually help uh, the cashier uh, between the registers. So like on the backside of the cashier stand, uh, and that should be completed here in the next couple of weeks also. And finally, we expanded our hero bonus uh, until May 16th for all of our frontline associates. Uh, and that hero bonus uh, is an additional $2 per hour for every hour worked for all of our associates in our store. So um, very excited to be able to do that and, and really um, um, looking for, continue to look for different ways to be able to ensure that our associates feel safe coming to work uh, as well as protecting our customers as they come into our stores. Uh, so uh, I know the big uh, question is, is about uh, the meat supply. Uh, there's been a lot of, of uh, media on this uh, recently. Uh, I would tell you we've seen some sporadic shortages um, overall, including um, pork, ground beef, and chicken. So initially it appeared that um, a lot of this was caused by pantry loading, um, kind of the hoarding that we saw initially, just kind of facing the unknown. Uh, and people were buying that to have some extra cushion. But lately what we've seen in meat processing facilities really across the country have experienced some temporary closures um, for one reason or the other, absenteeism or if COVID-19 uh, has directly impacted them. Um, so while um, most of those don't directly affect us, uh, we do anticipate there will be a ripple effect uh, from the suppliers as they shift product around the country to serve uh, as many customers as possible. So again, most of the manufacturers across the United States, uh, all of the retailers are pulling from the same sources. So uh, you can see where, they, where there could be a ripple effect. So at this point, um, we suggest that customers continue to buy their needs uh, without overloading on particular items. Uh, we have placed, we as in Kroger, have placed uh, limits on several groups uh, just to safeguard um, against that in an effort to make sure that we meet the needs uh, of as many, many shoppers as possible. So we've instituted the following uh, on beef grinds. We have uh, three packages per customer limit, fresh pork, two packages per customer, and then fresh chicken, two packages per customer. So again, uh, product is there. Uh, again, we just want to make sure everybody that comes in shops in our stores has the opportunity to be able to purchase uh, these particular items. Um, just know that there's, there's many processors across the country, uh, and they're all working very, very hard 
to spread the available product around to everyone. So uh, I know a lot of people have been, uh, you know, trying to imagine what a worst case scenario will look like. Not sure if we would have one, honestly. Um, each of the plants um, that have closed, some are actually opening back up. Um, so it really just depends on exactly what's going on and what part of the country that's happening. Um, each of the plants are monitored closely by USDA and local departments of agriculture. So we are confident um, uh, that they are being upheld to the, the, the highest standards of cleanliness and sanitation. Uh, we do visit these plants uh, on a regular basis and we are very, very confident that um, their commitment to food safety mirrors ours. And during these times, we are 100% committed to ensuring that the food products that we sell are safe for our customers. So bottom line, um, there will be some impact uh, that you will see and, you, and you've seen it. Some major um, um, competitors, Costco I know has, has um, put on some, some limits also. Um, so you, you may see that, but know that there is product in the, uh, in the supply chain. Uh, we're just limiting uh, certain items just to ensure that all customers have the ability to be able to, to purchase their needs uh, when they come in. So with that, uh, Bill, uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'll be happy to take them. Felix, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, there, We had a couple of questions and you've already addressed those. So thank you for that. And also we again, appreciate your investment in the community. Thank you so much. Our final speaker this morning will be Dr. Frank Rodriguez, the superintendent of Beaufort County Schools. Dr. Rodriguez, glad to have you on and uh, thanks for being back with us. Thank you for having me, uh, Bill. I appreciate it. Um, one, I think today I want to spend a little time uh, sharing with, with all of you uh, about a very difficult decision that I've been considering and having, uh, having really debating over uh, for some time, and that is how to handle our district graduation ceremonies at the conclusion of the year. Um, during, uh, as a lifelong educator, uh, for me, uh, this has been a difficult one. Um, but during many meetings to discuss graduations with high school principals and certainly members of uh, senior staff, we took the time to vet possible options. Our community has worked hard and made many sacrifices to minimize the impact of COVID-19. And these are no doubt challenging times for all of us. The South Carolina Association of School Nurses sent Governor McMaster and our state superintendent a letter thanking them for their leadership during these times and urging them to clarify that in-person, large gathering graduation ceremonies should not take place and that in fact, innovative and creative options are the only safe options. We have considered uh, all sorts of options uh, and, and through the feedback have settled on uh, as a result of all of, those, uh, all of that feedback on combining virtual graduation and then a drive-through celebration to recognize the great accomplishments of our high school seniors. This includes a commemorative video for them, as well as drive-through celebrations for their students and their families. Uh, district high schools will schedule specific times for graduating seniors in which they could bring two guests at a time to the school and uh, small groups of 10 socially distanced students and their two guests will then be video recorded as they hear their names and walk across the stage in caps and gowns. Each student, two guests will be able to watch them while they socially distancing in the auditorium. Everyone entering would be uh, required to wear a mask, although students will be able to remove that mask prior to crossing the stage. In addition to that, nurses will check the temperatures of all students and guests. Uh, no one with temperatures higher than 100 degrees will be allowed to participate. All of the speeches would be pre-recorded and the entire ceremony would be edited into a complete movie that will be posted on the district's YouTube channel on the day of each school's previously scheduled graduation. Uh, students will receive their diplomas at the end of the drive-through celebration with their families as they, as they drive through a celebration with our teachers and uh, community uh, uh, dignitaries that would participate as well. And so it's been a very challenging and a very difficult decision for me uh, for me, graduation represents really the crown jewel of public education and a culminating event uh, for our students. So this has been challenging, but I, I feel that um, 
uh, in terms of uh, safety for students and also members of our community that, that it is the right one. So with that in mind, uh, that concludes my, my report today. Dr. Rodriguez, thank you. I know that uh, that decision has been weighing heavily on your heart and uh, one that you haven't taken lightly. I think in, under the all, given circumstances, you certainly, uh, you and your team are trying to make and will make uh, the best uh, out of an unfortunate situation and also the safest, uh, the safest graduation possible. So again, thank you for your leadership and uh, uh, we'll continue to check in on you and with you. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. I want to thank all of you for joining our call this morning. And, uh, you know, we continue to create that forward momentum for better days. And we're starting to see a little bit of the light towards the end of the tunnel. We know that uh, we have to move in a, a very safe manner and we'll continue to, uh, to do so. Next week, we're anticipating having United States Senator Lindsey Graham with us. We'll also be uh, having Steve Wilmot back for an update on their RBC heritage and some additional speakers as well. So thank you. If you need anything, please reach out. Don't forget to check our website, thepathforward.org, or if you need to email uh, anything about Path Forward, please do so at uh, uh, pathforward at hiltonhead.org. Uh, thank you very much and have a, a good rest of your day.